Hi, footy fans. Welcome to the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast. I'm your host, Dave, and today we're going back in the day with a dual code international, played for Wales and the British Lions, and also played first grade for Witness and Manly for the majority of his career. Um, it's the one and only John Devereux. How are you going, mate? Great, thanks. Good to have you. Good, good, good to be here. Thanks, Dave. Oh, mate, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. You know, I was actually lucky enough uh, to get hold of you through Facebook and your book publisher, of all places. Uh, but kind of, you yeah. know, happened quite organically, which was unbelievable. So, you know, um, it's actually your publisher's like, do you want me to get you in touch with you? I'm like, oh, hell yes. So, you know, thanks very much. And uh, on that, um, you've had an autobiography published about your career. What what was that like in the process, getting all that done? Yeah, it took a bit of bit of time yeah about three or four years uh of my life uh spent uh going through old stories yeah but that was uh it was good to do it it's something you uh i suppose you want to do something like that after your career but most people sort of do it straight away as soon as they retire but yeah it's taken me a few years to uh get around to doing it but it's nice to have it you know it's um it's been a hard work but yeah now it's complete it's uh yes yeah, nice to have and I've got a grandson now, so at least he knows something about his grandfather. Um, you can yeah. read that one day. Yeah, man. I mean, that's why I love doing these podcasts as well for people who, you know, who doesn't necessarily have an autobiography about their career or things like that. So uh, to have that must be pretty special, man. Like your, your family, friends, everyone around the world will know what the great John Devereux got up to during his younger days. Well, yeah, like I said, I've had a great career and... Um, achieved a lot and um yeah so like I say my grandson like I, say, I didn't I don't know much about my grandfathers I never met them they both passed away before I was born and so um at least he'll uh he's you know he's the first grandchild and he's a grandson and he'll be able to uh read the book when he can read one day and he'll know everything about his granddad right that's beautiful really special eh? Right? really cool really really cool so um, apart from um, going around publishing autobiographies, what have you been up to these days? Like, what have you been up to post footy? Well, um, I work in the drugs business now, so I'm uh, <laughs> I've been working in the pharmaceutical industry for the last twenty three years. So uh, oh, yeah, wow. I work from I'm based at home here in Wales. I uh, cover all of Wales in the role I. I do for the com company, and yeah, it's. Uh, I've not worked for just this company in 23 years. I've worked for some big companies like Roche Products, MSD. Uh, I've also done some orthopedic work as well with Zimmer. I worked in uh, in doing the joints, you know, the knees and hips. Did that for a couple of yeah. years, but yeah, generally, last 23 years has been uh, the day job has been uh, promoting products, yeah, pharmaceutical products. Yes, I suppose after being banged up for years playing league, that's probably not a bad thing to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I got I got to know a lot of doctors and especially the surgeons with uh, the orthopedics. Yeah, you know, I knew all those. But uh, yeah, it was a good job. Um, it's, it's been uh, it's a it's a great job, flexible job. Uh, the doctors, uh, a lot of people are you know rugby people, so that helps. But generally, it's uh, it's got a lot harder over the last few years. Let me tell you, uh, yeah, the yeah. NHS in way in the UK. There's no money and uh, it's very hard. But uh, yeah, I'd say people are still ill and this, you know, we need drugs. So that uh, keeps going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, man. So let's rewind the clock. Let's go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up and what was life like for a young John Devereux? I grew up in a mining, old mining village just outside. I live in a town called Bridgen now. And um, the, the, the place I was born about seven miles north of here. In one of the valleys where the mines were when i was a kid i grew up with two two coal mines in the village little village called ponty the garu valley i was born there in 1966 my dad was a miner and his father was a miner in fact my grandfather uh, michael devro came over from ireland to south 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 southern ireland to become a miner in south wales back in the early 1900s and uh yeah, we um, we we all grew up there. My dad was born there. I was born there. And it was a great place to grow up. And everybody played rugby. Nobody played football. Um, and um, yeah, and that's how I started as an eight-year-old. Started playing rugby union. Uh, got quite good at it. Yeah. And then uh, went through the schools. Yeah, and and the youth and the schools rugby, and ended up in college and university playing it. Okay, so when you're like eight years old, sort of in that eight to 10, 11 years old, 
what was it that kept you going back playing rugby union? Like, what was it about the game that fascinated you? Was it the, the physicality, the contact, the just running around like a mad fella? What was it? <laughs> yeah, I think it was watching, uh, you know, the, the, the golden era of Welsh rugby on TV as well. Um, like I said, Gareth Edwards and Barry John, who sadly passed away recently. He was my idol and Gareth Edwards is, you know, I know him now as a, a great friend. Uh, but yeah, people like Gareth and Barry and Phil Bennett and Ray Gravel, centre, a great centre for Wales, and Steve Fenwick. Yeah, there's so many. JJ Williams, JPR Williams, Gerald Williams. So lots of lots of great players. Um, they're all backs, by the way. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a, gr- a golden time of Welsh rugby. My dad introduced me to the to watching rugby, and and uh, then I started playing it. And it's a great game. Um, like I say it was the only game to play at the time. Um, okay. uh, just great, great crack, wasn't it? You know, enjoy, thoroughly enjoyable. You know, getting your face, you know, smashed and cut, yeah. cut some bruises, and just carried on doing it, and loved the, um, loved all that physicality about the game as well. Yeah, yeah, I find just about everybody I ask love the physicality. There's been a couple that are like, oh, I played in the halves and hid behind the forwards. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I actually discovered. You were quite multi-talented growing up and that when it actually came to sports, you didn't get picked in rugby rep sides, like the schoolboy sides, if I'm correct. And you actually went and played football and got a cap for Wales or two. Like, how did that happen? Well, like you say, the, the kids these days, they don't play enough rugby and or any sport. And 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 we were lucky to, you know, we play in school rugby and then I play youth rugby. But um, at that time, in my time, it was about, yeah, around about 15, 16 years of age. I wasn't getting any luck with representing Wales or any of the school or year uh, category, so I, I started playing football as well and became quite good at it and uh, ended up getting a couple of caps for Wales against Scotland. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I think I'm a firm believer in playing multi sports. You know, I think the skill sets and stuff, you know, helped me a lot. And I, I enjoy football. Uh, I played centre yeah. forward. I was okay. fast and strong, tall. Um, yeah, enjoyed it. So good. Great times and played basketball and stuff like that. All these sports uh, are great for rugby. You know, ultimately it was rugby where my heart was. It's just at that yeah. time I was I felt that I felt I was let down by some of the selections and stuff like that. So that's why um, I had a, I had a go at uh, football. That's fascinating though that you could just go. Oh, I'll just try my hand at football and, <laughs> and represent your country. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. It's not even your number well, one sport. <laughs> no, it's not. But we used to play, you know, we played football as kids in the street and, you know, um, rugby was a bit harder playing in the street because the ground was a bit hard, wasn't it? You know, the concrete and tarmac. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, we played, we played, we always played football. But um, luckily there was a boys club uh, in the village, which all the boys would, you know, it's nothing to do generally in the, in the valley for kids, really. And the weather is crap. So indoor arena like that and you go go down there every night and play five side football and stuff like that so that's how we developed yeah okay all right okay so how did you get back on track with the rugby union um you played a bit of college rugby that was my lucky break in life to be honest because obviously i i had failed to get any under 18s uh schoolboy uh honors and i uh i sort of Good a schoolmaster that I had a long time ago always said to me, You're good at rugby, but just keep on working hard in school. So those are great sort of words of wisdom. And I carried on working hard at school. And all my mates left school be, to become plumbers, painters, mechanics. And so I yeah. I out of all the guys, all my gang, I was the only one who ended up doing my A levels, you know, further education, got okay. those and then went to college. Who would have thought back in the day, me going to college out of all my gang, you know? Um, because we were a kind of a a, a bit of a rabble, you know, outfit, right. and um, and we we're all rugby boys, and most of them were, and like I say, they all went on to leave school and become sort of firemen and yeah, painting and decorators, plumbers, yeah, and all that stuff. And uh, I went to university, so I went to Cardiff, and I went to a club there, a, a, sorry, a college which had a which had a big um, history in producing Welsh rugby union um, internationals. Right. Uh, back in the time, it was called Cardiff College. It was a university, and uh, I was doing um, basically be- to become a, f- a, a PE teacher. So it was a p- teacher training college. And uh, but the rugby team was excellent side, and we played all the big clubs in Wales at the time, even though we were we were students. Um, 
And that's when my lucky break started. And um, yeah, in my second year, we played Cardiff in the, the Welsh the Welsh Cup in Rugby Union. Uh-huh. And I came up against a guy called Bob Ackerman, who okay. was centre in British Lion for Wales and British Lion. And uh, he, on went, he actually went on to play rugby league as well with me in Wales. And wow. Bob was playing his first game for Cardiff that day. And my calling card in rugby has always been this big fend, you know, big handoff. Yep. So I put Bob on his backside a number of times in that game, and we narrowly lost the game to Cardiff, who were uh, and it, well had ten internationals playing that day. Wow! So they were, um, yeah. So I had the headlines the next day, and it all sort of started from there. Really, I um, quickly then was selected for Wales, even though I was a student playing college rugby, um, playing in total unknown, complete unknown because I hadn't come through the schools. Um, Unit, you know, I hadn't played for any schools uh, representative team, so a lot of people say, "Where the hell does he come from?" You know. So yeah, fair enough. So this this young whippersnapper's got my spot in the team. Who is he? <laughs> well, so, that's um, what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, Bob Bob lost his um lost his place, and I uh, I took his number thirteen jersey. You know, centre. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's where it started. Yeah. So I was capped first game against uh, England in uh, Twickenham in nineteen eighty six. That's incredible, man. So just before we get to that, you actually played for Bridgend as well, uh, from 1986 to 89. Um, yeah. And for, for those of us, particularly down here, like in the Southern Hemisphere, was that the equivalent of your first grade rugby union competition in Wales? Yeah, I, I actually played there uh, before that as a schoolboy. Um, I, I guessed it for them a few times as a, as a 17-year-old. And, um, but yeah, it was my home club, really, like I say, and... Um, any, and obviously, when I was go to college, any holiday times, I would go back and play for Bridgend as well. So, but then when I left college in '87, I played full time for Bridgend from '87 to '89. Okay. I went on the British so, Lions tour to uh, to Australia in 1989. That's where I signed uh, to go rugby league after I came back from there. That's right, you did. So you said you made your debut for Wales and against England at Twickenham at only 19 years of age. Um, so. So how did you, like, what were your feelings when you found out you'd been selected? Like, were you like, finally, all my hard work's paid off? And you're going up against Arch Rivals England. Like, this is huge. <laughs> this is massive. Yeah, well, the funny story, I always tell you, is that I was on a field visit with my college, uh, you know, fellow college uh, pupils, and we were in, um, in this uh, Cardiff Castle. We were looking at the architecture there with a couple of the lecturers, and this chap appeared from nowhere. Like Mr. Ben from the it's a cartoon series over here called Mr. Ben, and he yeah he came out of nowhere and said, "Is John Devereux here?" This very important phone call for him. I thought, "Oh shit, something's happened at home." You know, there was no mobile phones in those days, so I went to this office, picked up the old phone, and and this chap on the other end introduced himself as um, John Dawes, the chairman of selectors of Welsh Rugby Union, telling me that I've been selected. I had no idea that that was happening. So anyway, I went in back up back to the room, told everybody, and one of the lectures said, I think that calls for celebration. So we went across the road to a local pub and we got, we got absolutely shit faced in there and uh, <laughs> celebrations went on all night. So that was the start of it. And yeah, and then um, getting to the, you know, the point where I was um, selected and, you know, get, got on the pitch, got my jersey in my hand. It was, uh, it was a proud moment for me, obviously, to play for Wales um, for my first cap. It's, it's every boy, uh, schoolboy dream, Welsh, Welshman's dream is to uh, is to play for Wales, you know. And and if it's not a card, if the next best place to play is, is tricking them against the old enemy, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I had Jim Mills on the show and, like, um, yeah. you know, uh, he, he played for... That. You know, Wales against England in one of his first test matches in league, you know, and you know, and, and that was in the World Cup too. And they were like, Oh, this Wales team's rubbish, and they went out and absolutely thrashed them, you know, pretty amazing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so yeah. good. So you're also part of a great win uh for Wales against Scotland. I think it's your second test, uh, where Paul Thorburn he kicked like a world record penalty yeah. goal from something like sixty four meters out. Like oh, yeah. hell, that's insane. How did all that play out? Well, it was um, the old stadium at Cardiff Farms Park was like a horseshoe shape, so the eastern t- east terrace was all open, and the, the wind was howling down from the east terrace that day. It was a cold, cold, windy day, and uh, it was my second cap. It was my first home game, and uh, okay. we were. Uh, it was a tight game at the time, I remember, and we had this penalty on 
we inside our 10 meter line. So it was 64 meters. And I literally, as soon as the penalty was awarded, I, I actually, my, my claim to fame is I said to Paul, have a go, you know, because I knew he could kick a ball, you know. And he had this howling wind behind him. So yeah, he had a go and boom, he stuck it over. It was incredible. Never, never to beat. I can't see anyone beating that. That's, uh, That's not crazy. not with these new stadiums where they're completely enclosed. You know, no chance. It went through the posts like still fairly comfortably, yeah. like in terms of height, but it just snuck yeah. inside the left upright. I watched the footage. It's That's right. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unreal. Uh, he's a great kicker, Paul. I mean, that was his. Uh, that was his strength. He was a. He was an excellent kicker, Paul. He wasn't the quickest fullback, or uh, you know, offensively he wasn't the you know the best maybe. But yeah, boy, he could kick penalties, and 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 that just kept keeps it you know the scoreboard ticking over, doesn't it? Keeps you in the game. The Scotland were playing well that day. They scored more tries yeah. on us that day, if I remember. But you got the win in the end with that penalty. Yeah, my first win, yeah. my second cap. Yeah, playing at home. So good. So good. Love it. So uh, in 1986, you were actually selected to play for the Lions on the tour of South Africa, but it got abandoned due to the apartheid regime at the time. What what was that all about? And like, how did you feel about all that? Because um, it was all cancelled and you played like a world side instead. Is that wrong? Yeah. I think I, when I look back at all that, in my first season, you know, I played four times for Wales. Then I guess they like they played for the British Lions and it should have been a tour to South Africa, but it was obviously cancelled because of apartheid, apartheid. And then, yeah, I just keep pinching myself to think, my God, I'm playing for the British Lions here. So in a game, instead of going on tour, we played against the rest of the world at Cardiff, um, yeah. at the National Stadium. And yeah, I remember as a, it was a lovely day, and as soon as we kicked off, the heavens opened, and it just fought the match. But uh, fantastic to be involved in that, you know. And we, we were awarded caps for that as well. So you know, that's un- unbelievable to to get my first sort of my first season having a British Lions cap and and also yep. four caps for for Wales. And and then to cap it off, then at the end of the season, we go on a South Seas tour at the Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, which was brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant experience. Absolutely. So during your rugby career, you played 21 tests. You were selected to play for Wales in the inaugural 1987 World Cup, which was co-hosted down here in New Zealand and Australia. Like, yep. mate, how excited were you to be going on a trip to New Zealand and Australia? Like, it's not like like now where we could just get on a plane and go anyway. Like, like, this would have been a big deal, right? We didn't have internet. We didn't know what was on the other side of the world, except it was on telly every now and again. Like, this must have been massive for you. Well, I'd, luckily, I'd been to uh, Sydney in '86 playing the World Sevens, so that, that that was in my first season as well. But then, obviously, to fly over to Auckland, one thing I had to get uh, sorted out was that I was sitting my final university exams, and they were clashing with the pool matches. So the Welsh University agreed for me to sit my three final exams over in two in Wellington and one in Dunedin in the university. Really? There. So I got that sorted out. Yeah, so literally we flew over. Scottish team and the Irish team were on the same jumbo, 747. Uh, We jumped the ship dry, all of us. And uh, we landed at Auckland. (laughs) And it was Armitage in those days, come on. And um, we landed at Auckland. And I had to travel. As soon as I landed at Auckland, I had to travel down to Wellington because I was sitting in my first exam the next day. So I left the team... Yeah, I left the team in Auckland. They're all celebrating big parties, um, awarding the, the caps because we all get a cap. I think my World Cup cap is there somewhere. And um, and I missed all that. So I flew down with the, the secretary of the Welsh Rugby Union, a guy called Ray Williams. And uh, we landed at Windy Wellington, absolutely howling gale there. But he's playing, the wings of the plane were flapping. Jesus. Absolutely cacked myself flying into Wellington. And then... Um, Next morning, I woke up a bit of jet lag and uh, went to the university to sit my first exam, which was I went in this huge room and there's this woman there, a vigilating, and I sat there for three hours doing my first uh, paper. Um, but yeah, amazing. amazing. I sat another one, um, but yeah, we had pool matches against um, Ireland in Wellington, and then we played Tonga yep. in Palmerston North, and then we flew down to South Island then. Uh, to Invercargill, and I had to fly yeah. from Invercargill up to Dunedin in a crop sprayer uh, on my own to uh, to sit my final exam the day before we played Canada in the uh, 
third and final pool match where we we'd already qualified because we beat an island. They were our main uh, rival. Yes. And that's sort of uh, so. Then we had a chance then of going from New Zealand in the shitty cold weather over to Brisbane to play England because yeah. England, the Jammy Buggers, had uh, they played all their games over in Aussie. So uh, we were in Brisbane then playing England in the quarter final. That was a great, uh, great day because we beat them as well. Yeah, you scored a try against Canada, if I'm correct. Um, and you guys flogged them 40 to 9. Um, and yeah. actually, as you said you went all the way through to the semi final against my own All Blacks, um, and unfortunately you guys didn't win, but you did score a try um, against the All Blacks in a World Cup semi-final. Like, how special is that as a memory for you? Well, it was special, but you can imagine being beaten 49-6. Um, can't be, you know, it's not it's not great for, for anybody, really, and any team. And But we knew, we only knew after playing the All Blacks how good they were. Um, yeah. We saw them playing against Italy in the first game of the tournament, and I think they got 70 points on Italy that day and John Kerwin scored a fabulous like 90 metre try and we thought they looked pretty good but you know actually coming up against them at Bali more there in that semi-final was um, something you know you learn a lot from games like that um, you know, yep. you realise how far behind you are behind the side I mean look there's a lot of been, a lot, of, a lot of things have been documented about that New Zealand side how how much time they were given to prep for that World Cup two years and all their employers were given, you know, given special sort of um, uh, compensation, I suppose, for players to have time off to train. And really? yeah, they were like, they were like a pro side, you know, and we were amateur and yeah. And I mean, I was fast, strong, big, stronger than most of my forwards. I was, um, I, I did a lot of weight training as a kid in, um, in school and, um, Proper weight training, not this, uh, not the stuff for the gym, uh, not for the, you know, the the, the beach stuff, um, you know, rugby, rugby stuff, you know, proper cleaning and, and squats and, um, yeah, and bench press, and yeah, and, and I was stronger than most of the, the a lot of my pack, but coming up against the All Blacks, uh, one to fifty, and they were just faster, stronger, yeah, well, unbelievable, quicker. Yeah, and, and it was, uh, but to, to score a try the way I did against, uh, you know, someone like Smoking Joe Stanley, I mean, I just, we had a move on, I remember, the ball came out from the right-hand side from a, a scrum or a rack, and Rob Jones passed it to Jonathan Davis, and Jiffy threw this missed pass uh, to me, missed out Glenn and Boy, my second partner, and we had this move on that the two would loop around me, but I just noticed, noticed uh Joe, smoking Joe hadn't come up in the line as as a, as a complete year, so I just took him on. I just had to go yeah. and luckily, you know, got over the line, and it was a it was a lovely moment. But just in the back of the mind, I was obviously devastated to lose such a such a big score, and it was a semi final of the World Cup, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I guess I guess when you look back, they were like like the All Blacks, they're like they're the best, you know. And, you know, to, oh, the best. about the semis as huge. Best side I've ever played against. Um, like you say, bigger than stronger, faster. Yeah, John Kerwin. You know, you had Grant Fox playing. You had you know, uh, Zinza. Uh, not Zinza. You had uh, Buck Shelford. Although it was a fight uh, later on in the game, and now a second row guy called Hugh Richards. I think he had, yeah. he swung a punch at Gary Wetton or one of the Wetton brothers, and then Buck Shelford just dropped him with a punch on the touchline. He was unconscious on the touchline. And as he was coming round, having the magic sponge, you know, swished in his face from the physio, the ref went up to him and went off. And I just couldn't believe that they didn't send back back Shelford off as well, because obviously in the game today, two of them would have gone, you know. But uh, he, he would have missed the final if he had got sent off, wouldn't he? Yeah, man. Uh, bring back Buck. That's the saying in New Zealand. Bring back Buck. You know, yeah. <laughs> we love him. Um, so uh, you said you got you also got selected to go on the British Lions Tour of Australia in 1989. So. What were the, some of the memories and experiences of that particular tour? Oh, it was great. I mean, um, if, just to give you a contrast of, of good and bad, the tour to New Zealand the year before in 88, I was unfortunately selected. No, I was I was so obviously pleased uh, to, to be selected for, for a Wales tour to New Zealand. But again, we'd been beaten heavily the year before in the World Cup and we were playing a two-test series against the All Blacks with uh, obviously provincial matches in there and, and and it just didn't start off very well and the weather wasn't good. We didn't stay at very nice hotels. It was a it was a pretty dire you know tour. But in contrast, the tour of Australia with the Lions was 
the complete opposite. Everything was better, you know. Yeah. Stayed at the best hotels. The weather was good. Um, the team was, you know, the best best players in the UK. And um, yeah, yeah, and that helps. And we had the, the best coach at the time, Ian McGeechan, on his first Lions tour. Um, Finley called as captain, and um, Clive Rowlands as team manager. But yeah, we had something like twelve or thirteen English players. Six or seven Welsh, seven or eight uh, Scots, and four Irish. How how times change? If you did the if you picked the Alliance team today, there'd probably be a predominance of Irish players in that. Yes, um, and very few Welsh, unfortunately. Yes, the tables have turned, eh? In the last few years, like yeah. who would have thought it was yeah. say All Blacks in Ireland playing a semi final at the last World Cup? Yeah. That was. Um, yeah, really? but it was a great tour. Um, it was a fantastic tour. And like I say, started off in Western Australia and then we moved over to uh, Melbourne. That's my first game, played against Aussie A. And then I started playing well, played against uh, Queensland up in Brisbane, um, New South Wales. Yeah, and then I like, in, twisted my ankle just before the week before the first test match. Um, so I was, out, I was just ruled out of that anyway. So, uh, yeah, and we lost uh, the first test match in Sydney. Which is never good on a three test series. Uh, but I got managed to get fit. I uh, got back on the bench for the third test match, uh, and we won. Yeah, we won in uh, back in Sydney. So uh, it was a uh, great series, great place. Love that. I love Australia, and um, yeah, it was just a you know a great tour, and and obviously made better made better by obviously winning the series. It wouldn't have been wouldn't have been the same without winning it, you know. So we came back as uh, you know series winners. So it doesn't happen very often. No, no, it's very, very difficult to to go onto it and win and you know offshore. You know, it's very difficult to yeah, get those I mean, series wins. Yeah, I mean, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia—they're all hard places to go as alliance team. Even though you've got the best, the cream of of, of British rug, uh, rugby players playing together, it is hard, obviously, you know, gelling together. Because I mean, for four years leading up to every uh, British Lions test, everyone's kicking shit out of each other, you know. So it's it's it's, it's pretty special. You got to gel together as a team, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you got the best players in 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 the UK, you know, GB. So, um, but yeah, uh, it, it all worked out in the end. It did indeed. And then we come to 1989, and you decide to change codes and go to rugby league. So, how did the idea of crossing codes come about, and how did you end up at Witness? Well, you know, it, it was just a, a thing, a, the norm really, uh, as a Welsh rugby player, if you're any good, it, it just happened. I mean, it was um, a number of ex-rugby union Welsh players had gone north. Yeah? And if you're a certain type of player, it kind of like the, the scouts would be knocking on your door or ringing you to sort of come and have a chat. And uh, and that's, that's basically how it happened. And I... I it happened more so because in after the eighty eight tour to New Zealand, a number of players um, left and went north. And then the year after, John Van Davis started this was the big exodus. He signed for Witness first in eighty eight, and then Paul Moriarty, a good friend, Paul signed for Witness in March of eighty nine. But then I came back from the Lions tour in August of '89, and I was looking forward to playing more rugby union. And Chris Casey, the chairman of Bradford Bulls, had chased me all around Australia trying to get him, trying to get me to sign for him, but I'd said no. And I don't know what it was. I I, I just got home and I got the phone call from John and Davis and Paul Moriarty saying, "Witness are really serious about signing you. Will you speak to them?" And I sort of agreed to do it. And they came down, and Dougie Lawton came down, and. He charmed yeah. the birds up the trees, Dougie, and <laughs> you know did. he said, "Ah, you'd be a legend in our game, kid." He used to have this fag in his mouth. You'd be a legend in our game, kid. There's only thirteen players, more room for you. I thought, you know, how I know that was totally untrue after the, after I signed, you know. But um, it's a, a lot harder game, and um, but yeah, I I I, I met him. I uh, we agreed terms, and um, that was it. I signed. Um, I signed for witness, and I was, I signed literally two days before I got married. Wow! Well, yeah. So my my wife didn't have much say, to say in the matter, unfortunately, but um, she loved it anyway. She we went away, and we have to witness is new, you know, just 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 married, just come, literally came back from a honeymoon. I had a phone call of Dougie on the, I landed on the Tuesday on a Wednesday. I had a phone call from Dougie, playing in the A team on Friday night, so I had to jump wow. on a train. 
I got picked up by Eddie McDonald, chief scout at witness. Um, he picked me up at the station at Runcorn, and took me to the, the hotel and I no training, straight in the A team against Hull KR at, at, at Witness. Thank God I didn't have to travel that M62 over to Hull because that's not a great drive. Um, and uh, and yeah, it was a Friday night against Hull KR and um, I popped two rib cartilages. The guy dropped his knee on me on the floor, banged my knee, the ground was quite hard. I hadn't done any training since the Lions tour, by the way, and I'd been on a honeymoon for two weeks, drinking drinking every night. So you can imagine I wasn't in a great, great shape. Um, but anyway, I was okay. Well, apart from my pop rib cartilages, they oh, jabbed me is. the next week. They jabbed me a couple of jabs in my ribs for the next week game. I played against Halifax, A team, a little bit more training, and then uh, I must have done all right because they they put me on the bench for witness against Warrington in a in a, in Wilderspool on a Wednesday night, and um, I went on after Barry Dowd. I was stand off, broke his ankle, and Dougie stuck me on the wing. And I was up against a black, uh, little black GB winger called Des Drummond. Sadly passed away a few years ago. Des, he was uh, a little pocket battleship, hard as nails, um, <laughs> playing for Warrington there. So that was my introduction to the first team with Witness. And then I didn't mm. look back. And I just grabbed it with both hands. And um, although I went up as a centre, Dougie, you know, had brilliant team, as you know, uh, full of yes. great players, John and Davis, Tony yep. Myler. Andy Currier in the centre with Darren Wright. Yes. Um, Mark, Mia Martin of Fire on the wings. Oh, stop it. There was no room, really, anywhere. And I just literally, an opportunity came up on the wing and um, and I just grabbed it with both hands. So I ended up playing playing wing for quite a long time. Yeah, Played centre at Absolutely. some games. But most of the time, you know, it was, uh, it was on the wing. Yes, right. Well, I had um, Amosi Colotta on the, the podcast. Yes. Great Amosi, yeah. what a great man. Now, I asked him yeah, how a, he converted from man. Rugby Union to League, and he said he thought it was going to be a piece of piss. He thought it was going to be so easy. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out for him it wasn't, but he played in the forward. How was it for you? Yeah. How did you transition? And, um, you know, like yeah. you said, was there actually less space on the field compared to Union? It's not so much less space, it's just, you know, the defences are better. And, and you know, your first line of defence, you, you know, you generally, you, if you don't, if you don't put some skill on or run a right angle, you're just going to get smashed, you know. Um, but so once you get past the first line in league, you know, there is some space. And then you generally are cut down by someone coming in from the side. I found that more so in Aussie when I played for Manly. But yeah, Mossy, do you know the story where Mossy signed, right? I played in the game. He played on the 88 to a, a Wales tour to a New Zealand in 88. Mossy played for Wellington, played with uh, Hicker Reed. Um, you know, John John Gallagher, uh, a full back. Uh, Johnny Schuster was in the centre that day. So, oh, wow. Mossy was up and coming. He had aspirations of playing for the All Blacks, you know. He, although he was yes. a Tongan, he'd been schooled in New Zealand and uh, he was going yeah. on the trajectory. He was, you know, hell bent on playing for the All Blacks. And Dougie saw him playing against Wales on that day and yeah. jumped on a plane and went over to sign him. And uh, he right, signed yeah. him, and I was absolutely gobsmacked when Mossy signed because I knew how much he wanted to play for the All Blacks, you know. So Dougie done must have again done the, the, the talk, 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 talk the birds up the tree. He did his sweet talking, offered him a lot of money or whatever, or promised him a lot of money, I'm sure. And then he yeah. went over to witness. So yeah, Mossy, great player, what a player. I mean, Kurt Sorensen and him, the Seni Formali or Joe Grimmer. These guys, yeah. you want to see them in full flight, just busting through the line. And it was easy for us boys. They were just bust through the line. You just get on their shoulder, you know. And um, But it was great yeah. times, great team. What a team. I mean, uh, my first, one of the first things I did was sat in the stand at Old Trafford, uh, just signed for Witness. And I sat in the stand at Old Trafford watching Witness playing against the Canberra Raiders in the World Club Challenge game. Oh, yeah. And we were getting battered in the first sort of like, 20 minutes. I think it was right. 17 nil down. I was thinking, oh my God, we're going to get bad to do it. And then the boys turned it around um, and, yeah. and won the game. But yeah, but yeah, some special players in that team. Absolutely. I've had Kurt Sorensen, Amosi, Asini, Jim Mills, and now yourself yeah. all from yeah, Witness no, Legends. Crazy. Yeah, great players. Great players. Love playing with those. You know, Kurt was like, God, when I signed, how old was Kurt? He must have been when I signed in 89, he was a, must have been around 33, something like that. I mean, he played at yeah. Wembley in 93. I think he was about 36, 37, or maybe older. Yeah, just God, he scored, 
Scored a you. try against Wigan. Yeah. He did. He, just, uh, he was desperate to play. We, we all were. For every, for every rugby player, it's the holy grail to play a Wembley in the Challenge Cup final. And Dougie had promised the board had witness that he would get witness to the fight, you know, to Wembley Challenge Cup more yeah. more often than not, you know, and we just kept failing all the time with when yeah. Dougie was in charge. We lost the bloody yeah. old I mean, Oldham, we were playing second division rugby. I mean, we lost to Oldham, then we drew Saints in the first round the year after, and we lost to Saints. Then we then Dougie left and then we went and we got to the final eventually in ninety three against Wigan, you know, and I was with Phil Larder in charge. Yeah. You played in that, didn't you? Yes, that was the game yes. the last year I played before I jumped on a plane to come over to play for Manly. Yeah. Correct, was, correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. But um, so Witness won uh, the Premiership Trophy in your first season when you were there. But you you were on the bench. But did you actually get on the field that match? Yeah, I got on that day. Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we the the one we lost, we lost against Hull. No, uh, uh, no, Crusher. Crusher Cleal was coaching Hull. Crusher Cleal. So that's the game. Yeah. yeah, we we used to win the Premiership, and Wigan used to win the Challenge Cup. I mean, we. You know, Wigan went on a run, I think, seven, eight or nine times. They won it in a row. And obviously, we would play the Premiership um, and beat beat Wigan and all the other sides. We would, you know, I think we won it something like four or five times on a row. And then we lost. Wow. We lost it. We lost uh, to to Hull, yeah. Uh, when when Crusher was, was coaching them. But, um, yeah, I, like I said, I played a couple of finals in the, uh, the Premiership finals and Lancashire Cup. And and then the Regal Trophy was probably the last trophy we actually won, you know, before we went to Wembley in '93, where we should have beaten Wigan that day. I mean, I didn't have a great game that day. I'd been injured uh, a week or so before that game and hurt my back. I remember I was having intensive physio and I managed to get, you know, selected, but I wasn't 100%. And, you know, it's, it's one of those where you, you just want to play so much. And sometimes when you look yeah. back, I was, was I 100% fit. And I didn't have my best game. Playing against Wigan that day in '93, I I was lost my focus as well. And Martin the Fire was playing for Wigan that day. He'd left Witness and a world record fee he'd signed for Wigan uh, for Wigan. And all I wanted to do was just run over the top of him. I just lost my focus. And I remember running and once I just caught an elbow off him right across my temple, and I I was in possession and lost the bloody ball. And then I woke up seeing Dean Bell going under the sticks, you know. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a great game for me. Um, look back at that game. Probably one of the worst games of my career, really, in rugby league. Really? But, um, yeah, if there's any advice for any kids out there, just don't don't lose focus. Don't, you know, you just play your game. Don't worry about... I was, I was just playing against Martin. I wasn't worried about playing him. But I just wanted to really, you know, just, I don't know, just wanted to run over the top of him every time I had the ball. And, you know... Kind of like he because he wasn't the best of uh, tacklers, but I just copped a, a, a slight elbow off him as I was going through, you know. Yeah, he didn't do it deliberately, it was just an accident. But I, I was sparkle for a couple of seconds, dropped the ball, and then I woke up and Dean Bell was running under the stick. So, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't a great feeling. And to make Martin's worse, uh, Richie is a, a loose forward. He tried to take Martin's head off then in the, in the middle of the park with an elbow and got sent off. I mean, if you're going oh. to get sent off, make sure, make sure you make contact. You didn't even bloody make right. contact. <laughs> you know, if you're going to get sent off for something like that, you may as well, you know, hit the target, like, you know, but uh, yeah. he didn't. So he still got sent off, and that was the yeah. end of it then. Once we, once we were down a man, and then the San Panapa scored the, the winner, I think, under the sticks. Yeah, crazy. So um, what was it like, though, uh, the result aside, finally getting to run out for a Challenge Cup? Because, like, the crowds are huge. The atmosphere is mental. Like you're finally there. Like you're like I made no, it. It's I'm best, best, no, it's the best feeling of the day. I mean, the whole town of Witness come down. You know, they just yeah. end on Wembley, the Twin Towers, the old stadium, the fabulous pitch, like a billiard table. Um, I mean, the stadium was old, and people were sitting on planks of wood. I mean, it wasn't the best <laughs> from that point of view, but um, it was just heaped in uh, history. You know, FA Cups and Challenge Cups. Yeah. So yeah, it was. Um, Great to get there. I had luckily played the year before then. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that moment. Um, World Cup final against G for GB against Australia. So I might, yeah. you know, I played. That was my first game at Wembley, playing for Great Britain against the Aussies in the World Cup final yeah. in '92. Yes. So yeah, I was actually literally going to move on to Test Footy <laughs> after that question. 
<laughs> so I was going to go back to 1991. You received your first Welsh Test cap in rugby league. You played Papua New Guinea. You put a cricket score on them, 68 nil. Um, yeah. But you, even though there was 13 tries scored, you didn't manage to get one. <laughs> no, I was one of those games. Yeah, well? I was. Uh, the ball just didn't come to the right hand side. Uh, they they were like rabbits caught in headlights that day. The you know the Papua New Guinea players. They were. You know, they're used to 110 degrees. I've been to Papua New Guinea twice on tour in 1990 and 92, yeah. and it's boiling, it's 110 degrees. And they came to Swansea, freezing cold October night, um, you know, and if they could wear woolly gloves, I'm sure they would have. It was cold and they were like rabbits in the head. Like, and we batted them 68 nil. You just like would dead, not yeah. have dreamt of a score. That was our first game. As a as a reemergence of the Welsh rugby league side and John and Davis, we had a great side. Um, that was the, yeah. the start of it, really. That was the start of a, a great trip, you know, with Wales and Clive Griffiths was coaching. Um, Jim Mills was team manager then. Um, yeah, and yeah, we played a number of games after that. Then a number of games: France, England. We played New Zealand down the Vetch in Swansea. Should have won that game. I caught the ball, but you know, and uh, scored under the. Six would have been a winning try, but uh, the ref pulled back for apparently Adrian Hadley, or the other, my wing, wing partner, he'd pushed somebody off the ball, and the ref disallowed the bloody try. So we could have won that game, you know, if I had scored, if that try had been allowed. So that was the start of yeah, Wales Rugby League, which culminated in '95 World Cup. But um, at uh, Old Trafford, we lost to England in the semi final of the World yes. Cup yeah, semi final. Yeah. Yeah, the game before that against Samoa was probably the one that everyone remembers and everyone who played in that game for Wales will always say that's the hardest game of rugby they've ever played in their lives. We played Samoa yeah. down the match in the semi uh, sorry, quarter-final of the World Cup. Um, it was a brutal match. Brutal. Um, some good. of the hits, I mean, people, people who are watching in the stand and, and on the terraces would literally hear the bones crunching, you know, uh, in some of the hits going in. Amazing game. I love watching big hits. Like, you know, I'm all for player safety in the modern game. It's all good, but I still just love seeing guys folded in half. It's so good. Like, oh, it was, great it was all in. I mean, it was so much passion um, at stake. You know, it was a lot of stake. Obviously, a semi final of a World Cup as well. Played it at Old Trafford, and England were waiting there for the successful team. And uh, I just remember it was it was so much passion there. The crowd was singing all the rugby songs. The anthem was fantastic. It was about 12,000 people packed into the Vetch. That's as many. You couldn't get anybody else in there. Um, and uh, I was, we always said when they when, when Samoa did their equivalent of the hacker, I can't remember the name of it, but they, they do a hacker that's, you know, the, the New Zealand hacker is basically on the spot and it's, you know, great to, to see. It's a great spectacle. But Samoa's is they start walking towards you as a team, yes. you know, and we all said, right, we'll line up on the halfway line. And, yeah. And we'll link arms and we'll just watch, you know, watch it and give respect. And I was at, next to a guy called Martin Hall, hooker for Wigan, GB in Wales. And um, yeah. he then, so as they started walking towards us, doing their hacker, Martin Hall decided, right, I'm going to walk to them. So the line <laughs> started to go into a, like an arrowhead. <laughs> and um, I, I always remember I, I finished nose to nose with Inga Togamala as the end of the oh, arc. Well. Oh, oh, yeah, that was a boot. And I felt sorry for the per first person who took the ball up from the kickoff. I can't remember who it was, but he got absolutely smashed. Unbelievable <laughs> game. I love that brilliant, stuff. Brilliant game. Brilliant game. Better, better. All the bruises and all the you know the effort was much so much better. Obviously for winning you. You can yes. imagine being the losing side, yeah, it would have been so much effort and put into it and not to win. So we luckily won that one. And um, But we had spent so much energy and, and emotion and, you know, in that game. We I think we had something like four or five days to prep for the England semi-final. England had yeah. played their, their quarter final two or three days before us. So they were, um, they had more time to Great. prep for it and... That yeah. was probably our final against Samoa, to be honest. We'd, we yeah. left, we emptied, we emptied the tank that day. Yeah. It's like you find that, um, I know uh, back in the days, in the Warriors days, when they were sort of in their first five, six years in the NRL, they didn't win all the time, but the teams yeah. that played them went home from New Zealand absolutely bashed to bits. 
and always lost yeah. the next week because they had nothing after being smashed. <laughs> Just yeah, that's true. that's true. That's yeah, true. It's it's like it's like all sport that is. You see football or rugby, you see a side putting in a big mammoth effort like that, and you always think to yourself, who are the opposition playing next week? Because I bet they'll be uh, still feeling that, you know, feeling those hits, physicality yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I love watching it. I wouldn't want to do it, but I love watching yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got a buzz out of obviously the 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 physicality. I mean, some players do. I mean, I I played rugby union like I and then I played rugby league like I played rugby union. I was physical, and it's a, you know you got a free license to smash people on the field, haven't you? You know, not right. as in dirty taking people's heads off, but literally smashing. You know, you couldn't yeah. do that in the streets, could you? So that I suppose that's, yeah. the, that's a big attraction, isn't it? Being able to literally. Someone's got the ball as a, even if they're just catching it. That used to be the best time as they're just catching the ball in. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, great, 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 great times. So you said about that 92 World Cup final playing because it was the British Lions in that final. Is that correct? Yes. Great Britain, yeah. Nice. Great Britain rugby league, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you came off the bench and yeah, it was 10 6. They're like, you're playing against guys like Mal Meninga. Brad Fittler, Bradley Clyde, Paul Thurin, and Timmy Brasher, like, wow. Yeah. Like, were you, were you, like, trying to get autographs during the game? Or, you know, cause <laughs> these are, like, some of the greatest players that have ever yeah. been, like, it's great. Yeah, you know what? It, 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 was a, it was a fantastic, an honour to be, um, I mean, even though I was on the bench, but, I mean, I, I got on um, because I think Gary Connolly got injured and uh, Mal obviously put me on then. And I remember just before, I think it was just before half time or maybe after. I, and then I think Phil Clark, who was, so I was, I played right centre that day and Phil was uh, either loose forward or second row. So he was my, you know, defensive partner, I suppose. And he took a bad cork to his thigh, you know, during the game. And um, I always remember that I was standing, I was looking after him more than I should have been concentrating really. On that play, the ball when Kevy Walters came away from the you know the rack and and I was standing too close to um, to Phil because I was sort of looking after him as well because he couldn't yeah. run really he should have been, he should have come off and then yeah a bit of ball watching and when Kevin came out of the rack and then he just sent that pass right across my face to uh, Steve Renoff who uh, by that time was on my outside shoulder and I yeah couldn't couldn't get him. So uh, nice. gutted to be gutted to be the player. Do you know what we were talking? Yeah, gutted to be the player that made you know made that era because uh, we were winning up until that point. Mm-hmm. I think when you look at all games in life, any any sport, you you can see certain things in games. I think maybe it wasn't written in the stars that day because um, that game, Alan Tate came off the bench and he played fullback and we bombed, put a bomb up on the, the six. On the Australian um, post, Alan Tate caught it. Uh, all he had to do was catch it and then just land on his over the line. As he caught it, he got tipped in the air and he came down on his back over the line and then he pounced on him. So if that if he had scored that, I don't it didn't I don't think it would have mattered about obviously the the, the, the Steve ran off try because we were we were we were you know we were leading there, but they were. But yeah, um, we were joking on the bus. I think someone made a remark like, "Why don't you be the person who cocks up today?" <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, it was me who missed the tackle. And yeah, I copped a lot of I copped a lot of flack for that. Um, yeah, for a few years really. And 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 then the bus journey home from Wembley, uh, all the wives joined the players on the bus to to to, to do the drive back from uh, London up up north. And all I could hear is all the women in the bus going because we were on five grand a man to win the match, right? Five grand bonus, five thousand pound. And all I could hear all these women going, "Oh, there goes me new car, there goes me new <laughs> conservatory, there goes me new kitchen." <laughs> oh man, you so, the team down. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but I was absolutely devastated. Um, yeah, it was a good opportunity. We, you know, it was a great side, Harry yeah. Anley. You know, Henry picked me off the floor after the match. I was in bits, you know. Um, yeah. and it's in the book, actually. It's a, quite a pertinent sort of uh, story. I mean, you know, to, that's the biggest of all cock-ups, really, to, to be the person that misses Steve Renoff going down the right-hand side there and scoring the winning try in the corner. But, you know, 
that's that's sport sometimes it can be cruel. Yeah, it can. But uh, you you were there. You were in a World Cup final. You got to take on the best of the best. Uh, we don't, yeah. we don't all get to say that. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great honour. And like I say, in my first season, I cemented a place in witness. And then uh, me and my wife were looking at holiday brochures, hard-earned holiday abroad somewhere in the sun. And next minute, I get a phone call out of the blue. Uh, David Oxley, um, chairman of, you know, or up at uh, headquarters at, um, up at Leeds, uh, Anthony Sullivan had pulled his armstring over in Papua New Guinea and I'd been selected as an injury replacement in the first week oh. hours of the tour, uh, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand tour in 1990. So that's me, 40 hours later, I was on a, a flight over to Port Moresby to join the, the GB team. So that was in my first season. So, you know, again, pinching yourself. Yeah. I'm actually, you know, on a GB tour and I'm in Papua New Guinea, for God's sake. What a place yeah. that is. What right. a place. Oh. I always ask my guests about Papua New Guinea. Please, you've got to have a good story from Papua New Guinea. Yes. Well, I've got several. I mean, they're it's lonely, terrible. you know. There's nothing outside of the hotel, and it's quite boring sometimes, you know. You, we're in the pool, you know. It's lovely weather. Uh, training's like 7 o'clock in the morning because it's so hot in the daytime, you know. Um, but the, one of the funniest stories was when I first arrived, I literally got off the plane. It was like walking into an oven. The, the plane 737 door opened. It was like 110 degrees, like I'm walking into an oven. A chap there picked me up at the airport, took me to the stadium where the game had just kicked off. Um, so I was, you know, trying to catch up. And as I was driving into the stadium, there's thousands of people I mean, outside the stadium who couldn't get in. And a lot of these people, tribes people, had walked from the rainforests for two or three days, walking to see, try to come to see this rugby match. They had no money. And then they tried climbing over fences or ripping fences down to get into the stadium. And I'd already driven into the stadium now in this little minibus, which I was on my own. And they started rocking this minibus as I'm driving through, <laughs> banging the windows. Um, so I was cacking myself. And then... Um, we they ripped in the fences down, trying to climb over us next, and out come the rubber bullets, the police rubber bullets, poof, have a bit of that. Right. Out come the tear gas canisters, poof, have a bit of that. I mean, you've never seen so many tear gas canisters in your life, and it's like a flipping, it's like a, it's like the fog it descends over this, over this, yeah. over this crowd of people, but also it then blows over the pitch. So we're in the stadium now, and there's a game going on, a test match with Cumbles against GB. Yeah. And everyone's running for cover. The tear gas is everywhere. It's in your eyes, in your throat, in, in, up your nose. And the people are trying to put you know, wet towels over your face. All the crowd are running and screaming. And wow. then this crowd of tear gas blows across the pitch. Huge tear gas. And then there's palm trees over the far side of the ground. A lot of people, locals, have shimmied up these palm trees to get a vantage point. And then well, they're just dropping out of the palm trees and just... Well, boom. 30 wow. foot just hit in the ground, boom. That's nuts. Um, and the, ga the game stops, obviously, and then the tear gas evaporates, and then the game kicks off again. It's just, all oh, right, it's just ca ca carry on with the game, you know, it's incredible. And we lost we lost that game, I wonder why. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and that is probably you get it. <laughs> I love it. And it happened, it happened everywhere where else we went. And that was 1990. I went back out there on a full tour in '92. I was selected from the start, and it happened every place we went. We used to have, we had these T-shirts made, "Tear Gas and Bricks Tour," because we used to lob, we were lobbing bricks over and wow. tear gas tour with all the venues of all the you know the teams we played. Ah, oh, brilliant! That's but the '92 tour, the '92 tour was Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, or coming kind of Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Australia. Yeah, one of them, but a bigger tour. Which is a great experience to tour Australia as well. What great memories! Um, what were the pitches like to play on? Were they just like rock hard, full of rocks and rubbish? Yeah, and rock sorts? hard. Uh, they don't have white lines. I don't know what they mark the lines with. It looked like tar or oil or something. But um, it, yeah, they were like concrete. Yeah, and it was hundred. It was in the mid afternoon, and you know, three o'clock it got hundred and ten degrees. And I remember we we used to have. They never had water bottles for some reason. And we used to train and they used to bring a bucket of water, right? And there was a bucket of water and everyone had one of those little uh, plastic cups. 
Where you've got all shit all over your hands, your bloody hands are covered in sweat and bits of garden, and everyone's dipping their hand in this fucking drink. What I tell you, I'd rather die of dehydration and put my hand in there and drink of that shit. Go on, Bernard. That's the best story. <laughs> it's amazing. I love Papa yeah. Nagili. I'll do best no, stories God. ever. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll jump back to um, your time away, sort of back at, towards the end of witness. Um, you scored a try against Leeds and you won 39 to 4. And Duncan Kirby wants to know if the try you scored was your favorite try for witness. I'm not sure if you remember the one. There was a particular match in the 92 93 season. I'm guessing it was a pretty big match or a big try. Yeah, we, we always had big battles against Leeds. I mean, we beat uh, Leeds in the semi-final of the Challenge Cup to, in 93 to get to the final. And, and it was it was uh, pretty special for us because Dougie Lawton had left with us and, and gone to Moneybags Leeds. And, and he has assembled yes. a fantastic fight there. So we battered them that day to get to the Challenge Cup final. We also beat them uh, in the final of the uh, Regal Trophy as well. Um, but yes. then we used to have some battles. The most of the big battles were always at Headingley for some reason. And um yeah, I think I remember the try. I I, I do a bit of after dinner speaking and I, I put on the, like a, a DVD or a, a you know memory stick, USB stick and I've got some tries on it. And I think that one's on there where I pick the ball up mid, you know, ten yard line uh in my own half and right. I, I I put a right step in and then I go past a few. And then I think I, I stabbed John Bentley right at the end and, and scored. Nice. Yeah, I was pretty knackered at, at that time. But always had good games against Leeds. And um, scored yeah. a lot of tries. I remember once I scored about three or four tries and, and we lost. So And I was kicking goals that day and I think we lost the game. It was a high-scoring game. And um, I think Ray French, I remember, he, he rung me up once and he said, what was the best game you ever played in or what, what, what memorable? And I, I, I suppose I said, I suppose at the time it was that game. I, I, I scored all these points for witness and still didn't win the bloody game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was a lovely stadium to play at. You know, Head in the League was uh, one of the best stadiums in the league, really. I mean, all the others. Yeah. Our, even our ground was dreadful. I mean, God, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it. Um, it's uh, the town of witness. Is a renowned for you know chemical companies, Stanlow Refinery, ICIs, chemicals, and the, mm. the town used to absolutely stink. It was voted Britain's smelliest town several times in the uh, the eighties, <laughs> early eighties, and it was worth a good well, five or ten five or ten points head start. All the sides used to play us because half the players were like reaching, going, "Oh, what the hell is that smell?" But you know, we lived there, and uh, we got used to it, you know. But oh, um, I think. It's cleared up a lot now. I do go up there visiting. It's a great place. I mean, I love my time with this. The people are all great rugby people and a friendly place. And um, yeah, we, you know, I came home. I've been home funny enough now. Crikey. 25 years I've been home from, from my time with this. Yeah. Crazy. So uh, 1993, you make the decision to move to Australia and play a season with the Manly Seagulls, like you say, after that Challenge Cup final. Uh, what was the thought process behind this and how did you end up at Manly? Well, Graham Lowe was coaching Manly at the time, uh, yes, at the time of the inquiry anyway. And I had a phone call from a good friend of Graham Lowe's who uh, said, will you be interested in coming to Manly? And this was around the October, November. And I jumped at it. I, I think it was... Uh, the, the the money side of it was secondary, really. It was just oh my god! I, I you know I'd heard so many. I've seen Jonathan Davis go to uh, the, the the doggies, the you know country yes. bounced down the year before. Yes. Um, Andy Curry, Andy Currier had been Balmain, wasn't uh, it? Sean Edwards had been at Balmain the, the year I joined, um, and then a number of others. Martin Fire was at uh, East, Henry Hanley yeah. was at West. So I'd seen all these great rugby players. From GB, you know, from uh, rugby league in England, going over there, and I and I heard that you know it was the place you, if you get a chance, you've got to go at because not many people got that opportunity. And uh, so when I got that phone call about me, you know, I jumped at it and I uh, negotiated a, a deal um, to go over there for the last game of the season, and the last game of the season, funny enough, was the Challenge Cup final. Yeah, against Wick. So myself, my wife, my. My oldest daughter at the time was three years of age. We jumped on a jumbo, flew over to Sydney, but 
in the time that Graham Lowe had signed me to the time I jumped on the plane, Graham Lowe unfortunately had a, an illness. I think he had a brain hemorrhage or something. He was unable to do any more coaching. And Bob Fulton had taken over. So I said to my wife, don't you be surprised if we get over there and he sends me back home. You know, he okay. didn't sign me. He didn't like pommies. He used to call me a pommy bastard and all this stuff. And uh, I said, I'm not a pommy bastard. I'm a Welsh bastard. Okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> so I got over there and, and I was, it was, we were met by Frank Sarton, the, the, the chief executive, a uh, bunch of roses, a uh, b- bunch of flowers for my wife, little toy for my daughter, looked mm-hmm. after us. Fantastic. Put us up in the Manly Pacific Hotel for the night and then picked us up in the morning and took us to a, a nice little apartment unit overlooking Manly Beach. And yeah, first training session there I was, beating all the boys, got up in the paddock, doing all the training session, all the different sort of um, skill stuff. And I remember a chap called me from the touchline and said, oh, Bob Fulton wants to have a word with you. It's a true yep. story. Come off the field, Bob's on the touchline. He goes, Heck yeah, mate. I didn't bring you over here. You don't shape up. You're on the next boat out there. You know, so uh, there you go. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I kind of like knuckled down and give my best, as I always did to every team I played for. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And so much so that at the end of my time with uh, with Manly, they actually wanted to sign me full time. But Thank because you. I was still still contracted to witness, still on a contract to witness, witness wouldn't let me go. So um, really, yeah. So, so were yeah. you like on loan, or was it just like because yes. it was the off yes. season for witness? Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was ba- doing a back to back. So as I say, I finished the last game of the season with witness was the Challenge Cup final. Manly had already played five five six games maybe. That's um, right. And then I jumped on. Yeah. So if if we hadn't got to Wembley. I probably would have been over there earlier, played more games. Okay. I think I played 15 games, plus we had a game in Mudgee, like a, a, a weekend off. We went to Mudgee and played a game over there. Chris, that was a hard game, that was. Against the lo- yeah. local side there. Yeah. So, yeah, 15 games, and uh, plus that friendly game. Wasn't friendly, like, but uh, yeah, it's a good time. And, and you know, I made some great friends there, uh, with big mates with. Um, Tony My uh, Tony Iroh and uh, yeah. Darrell Williams. You know, they oh, were two of my best friends. Oh, Tony lived right by me, so we used to he picked me up at first, you know, and we used to shit car share, then go to training, we played golf together. Because whenever yeah. I played rugby, when I went rugby up in uh, the north of England, it was semi pro. It wasn't full time. I I literally got a job up north as well, and myself and John Van Davis. And all most of the witness side had jobs. Um but then when I came to Manly, I was like a full-time pro. I didn't have a job. So, yeah. And Tony and Dara used to go and play golf most most days. Yeah. And or we go sightseeing. My, my, my wife uh, loved Manly. Well, she loved Australia. loved Sydney. And she'd go yeah. there tomorrow, you know. She had a chance. We'd, we'd you know, like I say, we had a chance. There was a little glimmer of hope that could have happened, but it didn't happen. And um, as Des, Des Asler says, yeah, I got Des to sort of, um, you, you know, uh, make some comments in my book um, and he said he, I was unlucky really that it didn't open up for me because that's that was the start of Manly then because we got to the playoffs that year lost yeah, to the Brisbane Broncos first you game did. and Brisbane went on to win it that year first time I think it had been done that they finished all like fifth or something like that and, got, and, and won the grand final that's so, right Yeah, and then Manly got to the grand final the year after I don't think they won it the year after but then the year after that, they won it. So it was the start of a, a golden time again for Manly. That's right. 95, yeah. they lost to the Bulldogs in the final. And then 96, yeah. they beat the Dragons. Just off That's the top right. of my head. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. gun yeah. side. And, and, Absolutely and stacked. Bob, yeah, Bob Fulton couldn't sign me. Um, so he tried to sign me. Tried to sign me full time. Uh, and then, then he went and signed Craig Innes instead of me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was a yeah, great team. I mean, crikey. You know, Matthew Ridge was playing in that team, but he got injured during that season, I remember. So that's when Ivan Cleary played quite a lot uh, right. that season. I mean, yeah. Cliffy Lyons. In my first game, right? My first game, I played against Country, Country Bankstone uh, over there in a reserve grade game. So I played yeah. 80 minutes of that game. And I came across, I went through a, a gap. I was in the open. It's 
chap, two guys come across and clean me out. One took my head off. So I, I went off the, off the field with a bit of a crick neck. So I was, I was having some physio on the table now. Jeff, I can't remember Jeff's the physio. Jeff, uh, the physio I went, uh, that man there, he was giving me some physio, you know, traction, pulling my neck. And next one, this chap came up to me, he went, you're backing up for the f- first first team. I was like, on the bench. I was like, what are you on about? I just played 80 minutes. Oh, no, you're on the bench now for the first team. Just no way. Away. <laughs> so the, the game the game had kicked off, so I was still having physio. So I must have missed about the first 15 minutes of the game. I went out there and sat on the bench, and we weren't doing too good. And then next minute, Bob Fulton goes, you're on, you know. So uh well. Yeah. So and and then my first my first introduction was Cliffy Lyons just put this lovely pass. I love I ran this angle and I was through and I was in the clear, you know, and oh my god, it was just brilliant. I was just knackered. Wow. I run I think I ran about 50 meters, tried to sidestep sidestep the full back and my my legs just caved in because I was knackered, you know. Um <laughs> but it could have been a great introduction score in a try on my first pass, you know. Wow, that would have been amazing. I mean, when you had like Jeff Toomey and Steve Menzies and yeah, yeah, oh, amazing side back then. Got Crazy. Ian Roberts, good. Ian Roberts, yeah, right, Cunningham. You know, Jughead was there. Uh, John, John Jones. Uh, what a team! You know, great side. Yeah, Jack Elsgood on the wing. Jack Elsgood. Uh, yeah. Um, was the other winger Hancock? <laughs> yeah, great <laughs> Hancock. He could move. Yeah. He's fast. Yeah. yeah. And it's gone John Opuati, John Opuati. Oh, yes. Uh, Big John. Um, uh, and then more, more in the centre as well. What was his name? Uh, first Danny name. Moore. Uh, Danny Moore, Danny. yeah. Yeah. And then the, the Kiwi standoff. Uh, I always forget his name. Youngster. When was oh, Gene Nami. Gene Nami, yes. Yeah. yeah, great player. So good. Great player. Uh, great player. Oh, good mate. Team. What an experience. Um, good team. So, so um, uh, Malachi Mansour wants to know what did you find were the biggest differences between the Australian and UK comp? Uh, faster, uh, more, more skills. Everyone, you know, faster uh, game, more. You know, defense was much better. Um, and and as I said, I, I sometimes I go through in in league in in, in the UK and <clears throat> I'd be away. But then I, I and as I said, I went through my reserve grade t- game and. I thought I'm in. I'm in the clear here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to th- go through and score here. And next man just get yeah. sized down by two guys, you know. Um, one taking me high, the other one taking my head off, you know. So um, yeah, just that the game was faster, more intense, um, and far more structure. You know, the, yeah. the sessions we had with uh, Bob in the video analysis, I, I it was just a, it was all new to me. We, we never analysed the game like that. A witness. Only okay. until we had Phil La- Phil Larder came, and he uh, he did he did more of that. But before that, okay. he just just get out there and play rugby, you know. So uh, moving back to Test football in 1993, you played on the wing for the British Lions, scoring three tries in a three 0 series whitewash against my beloved Kiwis. Uh, how special was it, whipping my uh, home country in front uh, on home soil in front of your home fans? Yeah, I, I was um, again special to get you know selected for that series, um, and uh, I came back from Manly and I, I was on top of my game. I remember coming back from Manly, I came back a better player, uh, fitter, stronger, and um, you know Mal Riley and, and uh, Phil Ada showed face in me, gave me an opportunity because I hadn't, I hadn't grasped the the, the, the opportunity in the '92 tour to uh, to Australia. Um, didn't go very well for me that tour, but then yeah, this was different, and uh, and I was yeah, I I just felt invincible playing playing yeah. those those in those first uh, well the first two test matches. We, Wembley was the first one I scored a, a try where Morgan Edwards let the ball bounce after a bomb from John and Davis, and that was my first try. I scored under the sticks then, and then uh, I was I think I was Jason Robinson's first first test match for. For Great Britain that day as well, he scored. And then the second test was at Central Park Wigan, and I just, well, like I say, I felt inv- inv- invincible because uh, I was just running through everybody. And and I went yeah. try. I think I, I had like four 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 Kiwis on my back, you know, going over the line. Wow. I should have had a hat trick that day. I remember I was literally the pass came to me as I was about to pass to catch the ball in the right hand corner and dive over. I got pulled back before I caught the ball. And the oh, ball okay. went to ground. 
And I was expecting a penalty try, to be honest. And a, a hat trick. Yeah. I was on a hat trick there. But um, <laughs> Gary, Gary Schofield picked the ball up and jived over the left side advantage, and there was a try to carry it. So uh, well, I wouldn't have had a hat trick that day. It was a great photo of me after the game with the, the, the cameras going like this. I was man of the match. And that, that well, photo is, uh, is the centerpiece on my book. It's on the front cover of my book. Yeah. Oh, good. So, uh, That's amazing. The, the, title of, the title of my book is Double Dragon, Double Lion, which is playing for both codes in Rugby Union and yes. Great Britain. So there's only been seven Welshmen who have ever done that post-war. Di Watkins well, is one, John, John Bevan, um, and myself and Alan Bateman and a few others much older older players you may not know but uh, yeah very proud of that but um, yeah that game that series uh, we tapped, capped it off then we beat uh, the whitewash in uh, Headingley we won three the series 3-0 yeah. It was, uh, yeah it's good to be involved good to be involved so what's the rush like as a player especially like a winger when you score like a, a long break or you make a break and you score a try, the crowds go wild. I mean, this is what you dream of as a child. You're doing it for your country. Um, just how good is that feeling? Like, what's the rush like? Well, that's that's why we play rugby, you know, to, to have those feelings, you know, winning and, and but just, you know, moments like that. I mean, the, game, the try when I went over with like three, three or four uh, Kiwis on my back. Um, the commentary by Ray French, you know, it was it was a special uh, moment. And yeah, you get a big buzz out of it. Um, yeah, you just want more. So it's quite addictive, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah. like I say, I was on fire that day. I was just, I just feared nothing and everything was going well. Um, whereas in the past, I had made some mistakes in games, which had spoiled my experience, you know. But obviously yeah. you keep, you know, it's that old saying, you know, you get knocked down, you get back up again, you know, you keep going. Keep trying, yeah. keep work, keep learning. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I always, I, I suppose, uh, the people say, "What will pe- people remember you for?" I, I mean, I think, especially in my rugby league, well, all rugby union, all as well. But you know, my rugby league, as we're talking about here, people in witness respected the sort of effort I, I think I put into my performances week in week out. You know, I always was a like a hundred percent player. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, players like who would flit in and out of games. Talk of one, obviously, you know, Jonathan Davis. He wouldn't be one of those physicality players, but he would, you know, just keep himself right. And then an opportunity, yeah. and poof, he's gone. You know, that, yeah. that try he scored, scored for GB against Australia. Perfect example of of how he was able to, uh, you know, use his pace to get around players. He, he wouldn't, he wouldn't use his strength to get through players. You know, uh, whereas yeah. I could do both. Whereas I could do both. You know, I could. Okay, I, I was quick but it was also strong as well all right yeah. that's a awesome skill set to have it's very handy <laughs> yeah so uh, did you actually like take in the crowd like when you scored a big try like that like you're playing in a big game do you actually hear it as a player or is it just you'd block it out yeah i, I always describe it even from my first cap train for wheels it's the noise is it's obviously big crowds i played at wembley 80 90 000. i played at um oh. took them um, you know and Cardiff Arms Park, 76 out, you know, you, 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 you're conscious of the noise, but it's in the background, it's like a din, you know, it's, it's constant din in the background, you're conscious of it. Um, and and yeah, it, does, it does lift you, and, and all sport really, when, if you're playing at home and you, you need that lift and the, the song starts coming out and all the support, yeah. it does lift you, you know, yeah, yeah, much, awesome. it's, it's, you know, playing, playing at home, Certainly, uh, you're conscious of it more, I think. Yeah, what a rush. What a rush. <laughs> so, like, towards the end of your witness career, you only played, like, sort of a dozen games between 1996 and 1997. Like, I think you only had the one game in 97 before you finished up with witness. Like, what, what happened there towards the end of your career? I broke my ankle. Yeah, I okay. broke my ankle in uh, in a cup match. We played in Featherston Rovers. And... Um, I I'd had an ankle problem. If something was wrong, and I was complaining of a pain in my ankle. And unfortunately, the doctor jabbed me before the game to kill the pain. Yep. And while my ankle was numb, I remember turning for a ball that was kicked over the top. My ankle just gave, just broke, and I didn't feel any pain. <laughs> wow. So I was just running with my ankle, sort of like you know flopping really. So uh, so yeah, that was uh, I was out for a while then. Yeah, but yeah. I had also had a, 
I'd had a, another injury prior to breaking my ankle, which I was out a little while as well. I think I had a, you know, when you prolapse a disc in your back. So I was okay. having a little, yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, the last sort of season or so with Winness didn't go um, the way I wanted it to go. Financial, if you remember the remember the Super League and ARL sort of split in the yes. game, yeah. Yep, I, signed a Super League con- I signed a Super League contract with Witness. We yes. were about to go into the Super League, and at the 11th hour, we were kicked out. They decided oh, to really? put the London Bron. Yeah, they, they decided to oh. put London Broncos in instead of us. That that was the, the first time that Witness had finished out of the top, whatever, for how many years? Um, and because of that, they they just cut us and they put um, Brisbane, uh, uh, sorry, London Broncos in instead of us. So I was signing, I signed on a, a Super League contract, big contract that Witness couldn't afford playing second division rugby. And then obviously um, I get injured as well. So uh, in the end, they they couldn't afford me, and um, I sadly left the club on not on the gra- terms I would like to have left. You know, literally walk, yeah. part to walk because I was old money. And uh, I went to rugby union. I went to Sale Sharks. The start of rugby, professional rugby union. So I went back to rugby union with Sale Sharks up in Manchester. So like uh, you played on for like another five or six years, right till you were forty, still playing union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I left. Um, Crazy. I left Sale Sharks uh, when I was thirty-two, thirty-three, and I played yeah. three seasons back at my old club, Regent. One game, uh, one one season, over in Pontypool, and then three seasons up the road with an old side, uh, my stake. So yeah, six, what's that? Seven years extra. Wow. And then at the forty, yeah, I was still fit. It was just, I mean, the ankle uh, problem uh, healed itself eventually. It took a while. Um, yeah. I was still fit, still fit, uh, able to play, still, um, you know. And then finally, my knee, my left knee, gave out uh, in my last season yeah. of my stake. And I managed to get to 40. I had man of the match in a cup match against Newport. And uh, and after that, it just, uh, I never made the semi final. We beat Newport and then I drew Neath in the uh, semi final and I, I never managed to play again. So oh, uh, that's wow. when I retired. Yeah, it was a good, good, good career in the, in the end, you know? Yeah, Obviously. absolutely. Yeah. Still a yeah, good, not when you know, make it to 40. Standard. No, yeah, you, no, no, no. I mean, Alan Bateman was in the centre with me. Uh, Alan played at Cronulla. He's a great guy. Alan, again, he's one of the very few who's managed Wales in both courts and the British Lions in both yep. courts. And we lived, we lived, we grew up a mile apart. He lived in Maesteg Valley and the next one over the Garu. Um, and we, he's a he's a year older than me and Alan is still playing rugby in the odd rep game, you know, the odd uh, wow. golden oldies game. So um, yeah. he's 16 now. You'll be 60 next year as well. Wow. You know, the yeah. one I can think of off the top of my head, Steve Menzies, you played with him at Manly. He, um, yeah. He's still playing Super League for Catalans into his 40s. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, saw, uh, yeah. I followed a lot of the boys that I was involved, you know, that I knew from my Manly days. I followed all their careers and Steve did really well, fair play. Yeah, yeah he's one of my favourites, eh? Um, I loved it when his final NRL game for Manly, he scored coming off the bench that 40 nil yeah. drubbing of Melbourne in the grand final yeah. in 2008. That was just so special to see that. That yeah. was amazing. I yeah. don't know if many people call him Beaver anymore, but that was his nickname when he was up, man. Yep. Was Beaver. Yeah. Old Beaver. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. So good. That's so if one. you look back at your career, is there any one particular season or moment that stands out for you that above the rest? It was one or two, you know, round about that ninety from ninety two to ninety four seasons. Yeah, those those are probably my best in league. You know, I I um I, I scored thirty five tries one nice. season. Uh, I tied with Sean Edwards. He was a Wigan, and, and we tied both of us on thirty five. I mean, most of yeah. us were Martin and Fire passing it back to him, and he was to just run up the middle of the field. Uh, I was to tease him about that, Sean Edwards. Most of us were just getting the pass back on the inside. He scored into the six. Mine were a bit more hard work and I had to work a bit harder for most of mine. But um, yeah, that was a good season. And then, you know, the season playing uh, for GB against the Kiwis, that, that series was probably, uh, you know, the, where I, and, and, and with Wales Rugby League, I mean, some great, great uh, games. Um, you know, we lost heavily to the uh, 
to Australia in '94 when I um, smashed my jaw. Mal Meninga tackle. I went into tackle Mal and he smashed my jaw in four pieces. So that no, those wow. those sort of memories they'll never leave you. And I remember those days for the rest of your, you know, to the day you die. That was quite an horrific injury, smashing your jaw in four pieces and the bone going straight through your tongue. But that was my fault, you know. It, I got switched from the right way, uh, right centre to the left centre, um, because uh, Alan Bateman got injured before the game, and uh, uh, Scott Gibbs was playing one of his first games for Wales, and they, he didn't want to play left, so he wanted to play right. So I switched with him, stuck my head on the wrong side of Mal's uh, shoulder, and I was in the first eight minutes of the game, and um, yeah, smashed my jaw in four pieces, and uh, was back playing thirteen weeks later, which is quite uh, quite a daunting. Yes. as well. Okay, well, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the fan questions uh, that I have for you coming up, um, which was from Steve McEwen. So there you go, Steve. Um, he, he asked how long was the recovery? So yes, 12, 12 weeks. Yeah. 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 Running into Mel is like running into a tank. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he was a big, he was a big boy, wasn't he? You know? <laughs> um, I mean, he was coming towards the end of his career, but he's still a bit of a unit and I just yeah. went in and like say I went to clad to him and put my head on the wrong side and caught a caught one of those you know caught his shoulder which was he wasn't giving way was he? No, he doesn't. <laughs> okay, so Stephen Thompson wants to know who were the hardest opponents you came up against in your career. Well, it's hard opponents who were you know a hard to mark or score loss you know tries. I mean, in rugby union, there's a guy called Philippe Seller, a French centre. He was probably the best player. I've ever played against in Union. Um, but then in league, there's so many. I mean, Mal was a you know a formidable player. I played against him. Um, I also went back to play for Wales in 2000 World Cup, if you remember. Uh, uh, did. Clive Griffiths called. Yeah, Clive Griffiths. I'd already gone back to Rugby Union. But in 2000, uh, Clive Griffiths had a number of injuries in the squad. So it was only a small squad of players that Wales had. And he called yep. myself and Paul Moriarty back from Rugby Union to play really? for Wales Rugby League. So we played, um, oh gosh, we, I think we played Papua New Guinea at Witness. Yep. Then we drew Australia then in the semi-final at Huddersfield. And we were winning after 58 minutes. We were still winning. Uh, Libria's had a stormer, scored a couple of tries. And I came on and... Um, yeah, we, we, we just tried to hang on, but, it, you know, the Australian team grabbed hold of the ball and just strangled us in the end. But, yeah, um, yeah that was uh, that was something, um, you know, nice to come back and play that, you know. We were, it was so hard for me and Paul because we hadn't played rugby league for a number of seasons, you know, at least, well, probably me, probably three, Paul, maybe four, four years yeah. before that. Yeah. Ireland almost upset yeah, England in that of, World Cup lots too. Lots of great players, you know. Lots of great players. Um, you know, in, in the British League, you know, you had people like New Love and Gary Conley as centres. They were great players. But, you know, I generally had, you know, you always used to acquit yourself, didn't you? Say, did you have the better of the opposite, opposite man in, in any game? And I, I would always want to win that battle. So there weren't many yeah. that would, I would turn around and say, oh, you had the better of me. I mean, obviously, Mal had the better of me when I played. Against him in that game, but um, there are some great Australian players and Kiwis that I played against. Um, more, more so, too, too many to new to not to name really. So many, so, so yeah, you yeah. know, I, I think that that period of rugby league that I played in was so many great rugby players. Um, yeah, there's less, less now in the British game, you can't really see it. You know, most teams in my time had world class players. You know, if he was having a bad game. This guy would have a you know great game, and but you know the Wiggins and the Leeds and the Bradfords and the St Helens and all these teams are you know world class players. Um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Eh? So, um, Mike Harrison wants to know what code did you think you were better suited to, and um, would you have liked to have played rugby league or rugby union now as opposed to <laughs> back in your day? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd swap. What I had, I think I, I've been lucky to experience both. I think um, the way I played rugby union was how I played league. I was a very physical guy, so I suppose rugby league did, you know, suit. I suited rugby league, obviously. Um, and uh, but I wouldn't change anything. Um, I just think um, 
you know, I, I had a great time and uh, being able to experience both codes. Um, yeah, that's probably Fair enough too. Um, and Kane Anderson wants to know uh, if Wigan or any Super League champions had a full preseason, a full roster, and a reserve grade in the NRL, would they make the top eight? Wigan, right? Um, well, any Super you know, League champion I, side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, go, go, going back to my day, yeah, yeah, they would have. Um, I don't think so today. No, not really. Um, I, I just look at the, the the British game, and it's just it's uh, it hasn't got that that to me. It hasn't got those key marquee players uh, like it had in my day, and and certainly to be honest, what do I watch? I watch mainly Australian rugby league. I, I don't tend to watch much rugby union. So I get all the Australian rugby league now and I'm obviously watching it all keenly and, and loving it. I mean, there's some really good games of rugby union on at the moment with the European Cup matches. And then you've got the super rugby down Southern Hemisphere in rugby union, which is great. But generally, the standard of rugby league in the UK is not as it should be. You know, it's not... You know, I know Wigan beat uh, Penrith in the World Club yep. Championship, but... Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's on Wigan's patch and Penrith haven't played, you know, haven't started the season or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah. it's always kind of hard, harder to travel here and play here. And, but yeah, um, well, what, you know, it, it could it could be, but like I say, the, the, the standard in Australia is quite high as well. There's a lot of sides now. It's quite an open yeah. year, isn't it? It's quite a lot of... Uh, it's a lot more to pick a game. <laughs> Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So I've got a few fun questions to finish with. So who who do you support in the NRL and who's going to win in 2024? Well, I obviously support Manly, don't I? So uh, that's that's a given. Um, it was frustrating last year, um, but um, they've started well and then they hit a bit of a rock. You know, um, the, the, I suppose the lose, loss against uh, Parramatta was a, a bad one at the end there. And um and then they didn't show up uh, the week after. But yeah, the draw on the weekend wasn't great, and it's a shame they didn't, you know, get that opportunity with the golden golden point or whatever you call it. And um, yeah, but yeah, Manly's Manly's, you know, my my side. Uh, who do I think will win it? I did say Brisbane Broncos, but they started off badly as well. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, they didn't. It's like say it's quite open. Too hot. It's quite open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, certainly so won't be south. certainly won't be south, I suppose. Okay, no, no, it won't be. <laughs> so, what is your favorite TV show of all time? Oh, uh, TV show, oh, loads. Um, TV show. Oh, I just love all the all the old programs from the seventies. Really, it's the stuff that you can't show on TV these days. You know, yeah. um, Little Britain. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's that's more recent. But yeah, just all the old. Sitcom, you know, all the old programs like, um, yeah, Del Boy and all that stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Only Fools and Horses, that's great. Only Fools and Horses, <laughs> you know, yeah. Porridge, Porridge is fantastic. Um, just all the old stuff, really. Like I say, a lot of the stuff you can't have on TV these days, yeah, I know, because it, it's just poking holes in people. And yeah, we, we live in a we live in a wokey world, and yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's very PC now, you know. Well, like, yeah, it uh, is. Yeah. The young ones yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, young ones exactly. That, that, that I mean, being yeah. a student, I could relate to all that as well. And it's so funny, you know, bit, <laughs> the farcical, farcical, but daft, but funny, you know. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, final question: If you were on death row, what would your final meal be? Oh God, there you go. Um, uh, I don't know. Still a steak man, but um, yeah, good steak, nice big tomahawk or something like that. Yeah, steak and chips, beautiful with a, with, with a pepper sauce. Yeah, that'll probably be it. Oh, I love it. Although I'm a big, I love Thai food. I do love Thai food. I, I, I yeah, yeah. Here we go. John Devereux says Thai food and steak and chips. <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> but oh, steak well, and chips a starter. Steak and chips yeah. a starter. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast. Going back in the day with me, it's been an absolute privilege uh, to meet you and hear your stories of 
what an amazing career you've had. And um, yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. Thanks, dude. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Oh, awesome, man. So uh, thank you to everyone out there for watching on YouTube and listening on Spotify. Make sure you follow those channels and get on the Facebook group, the Point of Difference Rugby League Facebook group. Um, we've got so many amazing players and people in there. It's a great group. You can share all your nostalgic photos and memories of rugby league because that's what we're all about. And it's a fantastic place to be. So thanks again, John, and we'll see you all next time for kickoff. Full time.